Hey guys, thanks for tuning into the Vanguard. Today we're joined by Brendan, of the, uh, who's the National Press Officer for the IWW, the International Workers of the World. Uh, I'm Zach. I'm Gavin. Um, Brendan, if you could just start by uh, telling the listeners a little bit about the Industrial Workers of the World and um, what you guys are and, and maybe a little bit about your guys' rich history. Yeah, absolutely. I love talking about the uh, history of the IWW. Um, it's really fascinating. Uh, so really, like, the way to think about the IWW is it was sort of formed as a result of um, many compounding issues and various groups that sort of met and coalesced in 1905. Um, so the first group that really helped spark this idea of, like, what the IWW could be was the Knights of Labor. Um, they were this like fraternal organization that sort of functioned as an association and in some cases like a union um, after the Civil War. They started in 1869. And by the 1880s, they had around 800,000 members, which was around like 20% of the U.S. workforce. So they're a really powerful uh, group for a very short period of time, about 20 years and after the Haymarket Riot in 1886, they started to lose a lot of their members. The Knights of Labor were really active in pushing for the eight-hour workday. Um, they had organized through industrial unionism, which I'll talk about in a minute, rather than focusing on the craft of a worker. And they also had sort of like moral imperatives for their association, which kind of got dropped in later unions. So like if you were a gambler or you sold liquor, you weren't allowed to join. Um, but they were really like the first major industrial organization that existed in the United States. And it really was the first time that um, Americans had really been exposed to something of this nature. Uh, really prior to this, there were mostly like smaller craft unions that tried to retain whatever like small, smaller and smaller pieces of the pie they could get. Um, after the Industrial Revolution happened and everything became mechanized. Um, so the Knights of Labor really inspired the idea for the IWW. And I think their slogan was something like, an injury to one is a concern of all. And that eventually became morphed when the IWW was formed to an injury to one is an injury to all. Um, so it played a large role in forming the consciousness um, of Wobblies. And there are two other groups that really helped this idea along. Um, the Western Federation of Miners is another group that really helped push this idea of industrial unionism. Um, they were started in 1893, which was three years after the United Mine Workers were started. And historically, like the UMWA, the Mine Workers Association, was always more conservative. Um, they focused on like better mining conditions, better pay. Um, they would strike periodically, but oftentimes like really wanted to get into like protracted strikes. The Western Federation miners though were much more militant. Like these were the guys working in the hard rock mines out in Colorado, Idaho, uh, British Columbia, places like that. And so the difficult work in those conditions really strengthened the idea of building something that was much more militant. And one of the organizers for the Western Federation of Miners would go on to be a major leader in the IWW, Big Bill Haywood. And he grew up as a miner out in the West. Um, he started being a miner, I think, like at age nine. And the Western Federation of Miners and Haywood realized that after a series of strikes in like the late 1890s, that they needed to expand beyond just miners in order to sort of win these demands, fight back against these coal bosses who could just bring in not only scows, but like Pinkerton agents to just go ahead and shoot up camps. Um, so it had to be something bigger than just one workplace. And the last union that really inspired the IWW was a group called the American Railway Union, uh, the ARU. Um, they were formed in 1893, so the same year as the Federation of Miners. And they were really important because within just a year, they had become one of the most powerful industrial unions in the country, but they were also crushed like within a year. Um, so they didn't really survive that long. But it's important to note that um, they had a really successful strike only like a few months after forming. And in 1894, they tried to pull off one of the biggest strikes in the country at that time, the Pullman strike. And 
these rail cars where workers um, were working in, they would travel from like city to city. Um, the rent that the owners would charge in some of these apartments and where they would let their workers sleep were so, so, so high. Um, the depression of 1893 really hit them hard. So they tried to increase uh, the costs on the workers, decrease pay. And if you've ever seen like that little cartoon where the guy's getting squished in that machine, and it says like high rent, low pay. And it's like, why does this cartoon seem so familiar in 2020? Um, it comes from that strike because rent was going up workers wages had been cut by like 20%. And it was a major strike that like most strikes at the time were broken up by the National Guard. <laughs> um, and one of the major leaders in that was Eugene Debs, who would again go on to help form the IWW. So I bring all that up because each one of these organizations sort of influenced the idea of what it means to organize industrially. So when you talk about like how the IWW was formed and how it organized, the goal was you have to get every single worker into a giant union, not separate like federations or affiliations, and they form together like the AFL does, the American Federation of Labor. But you have to create just one big union where every single person who's a worker is a part of, and you organize by the industry where you work. So you wouldn't separate your job based on, well, do I run like the electricity to the rail car? Do I like run the bartending? Do I like do the coal part of it? it no, it's just, it's all one big union. Um, and so the IWW was formed in Chicago in 1905 as a result of all of these different factors. Um, some of the big leaders, like I said, were Big Bill Haywood, Eugene Debs, but there were others like Daniel De Leon, who was a famous um, Marxist leader. Um, he would go on to create like this idea of an industrial union mixed with a political party that could do things simultaneously. Um, you had uh, Lucy Parsons, you had Mother Jones. So you had all these really impactful like socialist leaders coming together um, in Chicago in 1905, starting this thing. And soon after the IWW was started, they started organizing back where they knew they had their roots. So they started organizing in Mines Out West, they started organizing uh, in textile mills, and they were really impactful in American labor history from like 1905 to like 1925. So they had about a 20 year period where um, they were pretty much on every newspaper. Um, if there was a fear of dangerous like Reds or Bolsheviks, like they called them, or anarchists, um, they would always say it was an IWW. So there were free speech fights out West in Spokane, Washington, where Wobblies would go up and demand the right to speak freely. They would be jailed for doing so. Um, they would help lead this really amazing textile strike in Lawrence, Massachusetts, where the term bread and roses comes from because it was the bread and roses strike. Um, in Patterson, New Jersey, they had a famous silk strike. But all of these um, actions obviously got on the government's radar. And when you're on the government's radar, we know what happens. And so um, during World War I, the United States government started repressing the Union to a much greater extent than they had before. Um, they would arrest Wobblies for really trivial things. Um, they would find their offices, they'd seize their property. Um, they would try to get sweetheart deals for some so that they would squeal on others. And so by the time World War II or World War I had ended, like a few years later, the union was sort of in disarray because they had really fought the government for so much, for so long. And the rise of the Communist Party sort of led to a lot of folks who decided, you know, maybe, maybe we can't really keep doing this. Maybe industrial unionism isn't the way and they would join the uh, Communist Party, it led to low membership. And so for a long time, like the IWW was more of like a historical artifact than a militant machine. And it wasn't really until like the 2000s when the IWW sort of started back up again in a real earnest form. 
And in 2004, there was a really important campaign in Starbucks, um, different Starbucks locations in New York, um, one of the first organizing drives for Starbucks workers. And it didn't succeed, but it started putting the IWW back on the map. And it brought together like this idea, well, what do you do when you're part of a union that has low membership, it can't really pay for paid organizers or legal staff. How do you do this in crises like this? And so the IWW came up with a term called like solidarity unionism. And so solidarity unionism has sort of been the guiding principle of the union since like the early 2000s. What that means is every worker at a workplace is now the leader. Whatever those workers in their committees decide to do, they take those actions. You don't have to have paid staff to do it. Everything is done democratically. And whatever actions you choose to do, you're responsible for. So it creates a sense of, you know, I don't really have a say in my job, per se, but I have a say in what actions we do. And so you start to teach people about democracy in the workplace. And so for a few years, we had um, a really interesting campaign at Jimmy John's in the Twin Cities that lost a union contract campaign by one vote. Um, Stardust Diner in New York City organized with the IWW using this uh, strategy. Burgerville in the Pacific Northwest in 2016 as well. And so as these victories have sort of come together and Wobblies have started winning more and more victories at places that are typically harder to organize. We've seen that, you know, people really want to do this work. They just don't know where to start. And that's where I think um, we've come in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, just a, a question that comes to mind after you've shared uh, about the, this, you know, sort of uh, history that they began, that began with the, before, even before the Wobblies of, you know, moving away from a craft union into a more of an industrial union where uh, people who, uh, you know, from all sectors of the same industry are working together and demanding rights in tandem. Uh, I wondered how you thought, if, if you had given any thoughts on how that might be applied to the gig economy. Um, one of the things that I've been thinking about is how differently the people who, you know, participate in the gig economy as, you know, say a driver in Uber, you know, is compensated so much more differently than somebody who maybe wrote the code for the Uber app, who maybe works at the office in Silicon Valley. And, you know, it seems like there would be a benefit in joining both of those people in the same union so that they could both, uh, you know, have an equal vote. And, you know, the person that's, you know, working on the app design and is typically better taken care of and has, you know, more leverage with the company could advocate for the people who are, you know, typically screwed. I, I wonder if you think that there's any uh, way forward for that or, or had you considered that? Yeah. I think the biggest challenge when we're talking about organizing in like the 21st century economy, it's so different than when the IWW was formed, you had to interact with everyone who had different jobs within your workplace. It wasn't divvied up in the way that it is now, right? So in that situation, like it is going to be harder for an Uber driver to get into contact with the person who writes the code or the person who does the marketing or people who, you know, are halfway around the world. Um, and so I think what this has led certain unions to do is they have to find creative ways of connecting people. And one of the things that we found is, well, social media is a really good way to bring people together. And there's challenges in taking a campaign and making it go public before people are ready. But if you work at Uber and you see, oh, there's a lot of like interest in helping organize Uber, you know, maybe I don't work there as a driver, but I do something else for the company. I might be interested. If it looks like there's a public campaign that is doing a lot, it has a lot of good social media presence, more folks are likely to reach out and then spread the word to their coworkers that way. So I think the challenge in the 21st century economy is how do you reach workers that you might never physically interact with on a work floor? And we've had to find creative solutions to that. And I think in some cases they're successful, but it also presents those new challenges as well. Uh, a question I had for you was, you know, recently uh, as both of the political parties have seemingly kind of abandoned uh, the people and, you know, the Congress is just, or the Senate has just left for another holiday, leaving people to be evicted and, uh, you know, the coronavirus conditions worsen. Uh, 
Um, you know, we've seen the suggestion of a general strike trending on Twitter. It's been something that people have been uh, talking about as kind of a last resort option to get the attention of, I guess, the oligarchs, you know, to try to uh, get some basic demands for, um, you know, these rights. Uh, does that kind of thing encourage you? Or when you see uh, this kind of like Twitter activism, does that does it dishearten you as someone who's more, you know, in the actual <laughs> nitty gritty that's actually doing this work to organize actions? Or uh, do you feel like that's energy that can be capitalized on? So I think it's important to realize, like, a general strike, historically, they have been pretty successful. Like, uh, the IWW was very, I mean, part of our idea of what we're going to do as part of, like, a revolutionary union is you get everyone organized, you enact a, a general strike across all industries, you basically defeat the capitalists at the workplace. They have no other option, hopefully, <laughs> than to concede to your demands. Yeah. And then, boom, you're in control. Um, and there have been general strikes in the past that have won certain demands, like for free speech or higher wages. Um, but the challenge now, I think, is recognizing, well, what is a general strike and what would that look like today? Um, so when we think of a general strike, we have to understand what you're trying to do is shut down multiple industries simultaneously, but oftentimes the ways that this has worked best is if they're localized into specific areas. So in particular, like larger cities um, that can really last for a few days to sort of stoke the fire and hopefully spread it out from there. It's really hard to make a call for a general strike nationwide, expect everyone to show up and then get super disheartened when no one does. And then, every single repeated call after people are like, no, nah, I'm not doing that. Um, but I think there's some ways to think about this. So the United States really only has two major like labor confederations today. Um, the AFL-CIO, which is the one that has most of the membership and change to win, which has SEIU, Teamsters, and some other smaller unions. And the way that they sort of operate, um, they compete like on turf for different membership and dues. Um, but usually like they really only take strike actions after they have a contract signed. Um, national leadership will very rarely try to make the call um, unless they think they have the ability to win a strike. And when they do, they sort of just expect that the locals will respond. Um, so like recently SEIU had a strike for black lives. Um, other unions participated. It drew national attention, like um, a lot like the uh, dock workers union, the ILWU. Um, they went on a strike um, for, I think it was like eight minutes, 45, 46 seconds um, to raise awareness uh, for Black Lives Matter. And these are really important strikes that I think refocus the energy of the labor movement to one that is like focused on racial justice, but the economic leverage of both of those really isn't much. So they're more like symbolic strikes than anything else. Yeah. Um, and so if we think about, okay, how could we really do a general strike? If we were to do something like that, it has to be really close to the election because you want to force sure. the political powers at hand to say, all right, here are our demands. We want the people in power to meet them, no matter the party. And if they don't, you're going to face retribution at the polls. Um, but the unfortunate thing is, a lot of times, like, general strikes in Europe, particularly France, they're usually called when um, they're in a very weak position. And I think right now, when we're seeing calls for general strikes, it 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 makes me really excited to see that people are like, yeah, this, this sucks. Like I want to, I want to just shut everything down and change it. Um, but I think at the same time we have to recognize, well, have you done like the proper work of talking to your coworkers? Yeah. Would they feel comfortable with going out on strike on say September 1st, which is what I'm seeing yeah. um, on Twitter? You know, do you have connections with other industries? A general strike is really helpful if you have the muscle behind it. And a lot of times, if someone has a union contract already, they're probably going to be less likely to engage in any strike action because the union could get fined for doing so. And so probably the best place to really try to organize a general strike is in places that haven't been organized yet. 
Sure. Um, you know, Brendan, one of the things that we wanted to speak to you about, I believe you were personally involved in the uh, teacher-led uh, union strikes across red states, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I wondered if there was anything that we could glean uh, from those experiences as that left and as, as we organize workers broadly. It seems like that was the most successful example of a wildcat striking, at least that I'm familiar with in, in recent years. Um, uh, I, I just wondered if you could speak to that and, and, and maybe share anything that you learned or um, would take away from that. Yeah, um, the strike in West Virginia that sort of kicked off the series of uh, Red for Ed strikes, re I mean, it started actually like the summer before people were frustrated at their union leadership the both like major labor unions, uh, teacher unions in the state had endorsed the billionaire coal baron Jim Justice uh, for governor. And he had been a Republican pretty much until like the last second and decided he wanted to run as a Democrat. And everyone was like, he's, he's going to switch. And he did. And no one's really going to do anything to protect ourselves. We're going to be completely controlled by one party they're going to follow like the Trump playbook of basically neoliberalism, but to a, a much greater extent. And so everyone was really just furious. And the fire that started it was really a basic concern of over our state's health insurance. And uh, the organizing that we had put into it leading up to the strike build, built the, um, built the framework for, the wildcat strike that happened in March. So a lot of the organizing took place on this secret Facebook page. And from there it spread out into our different counties where people would hold sort of like ad hoc workplace committees, um, county committees. They would sort of decide what actions they wanted to take with um, the folks in their area? Did they want to do Red for Ed days? Did they want to go to major sporting events, raise awareness for what was happening? And it imbued them with a sense of democracy. And so as the strike progressed and people realized their own union leadership, they decided, well, we're going to work because we know best we did all this beforehand we knew what we were doing we trust our own abilities um and as, through the course of like the red for ed strikes you would see this model being replicated in kentucky in oklahoma in arizona this idea of you start by trying to reach the maximum amount of people you can Usually that's through Facebook, secret groups, people add people. And then once you can bridge out from there, then you start having conversations where people feel safe. They feel safe in the fact that they can take these actions because another state did. They feel the sense of class solidarity with people in their same field. They don't feel ashamed that, you know, they can't make ends meet. And they were able to take up this charge without really any direction from a specific union leader or, you know, a specific theory of how to do this. They just sort of did it on their own. Um, and so like the red for edge strike, I think is sort of an important way to think about what could have happened if we had spread that across different industries, right? So about 90% of strike actions, I think that took place in 2018 were either in healthcare or education. And that's because those were the places that had been hit hardest for so long by neoliberalism, austerity measures. And it sort of reached a breaking point where really wasn't another option on the table but to do that. But I guess the sort of sad fact is there, there wasn't more strike. People take this idea of we can do this ourselves we don't have to wait for someone else to do it for us. Um, if you are about to sign a really bad contract, don't. If you want to organize and build a union at wor your workplace, you will have the wind at your back to do so. And when thinking about that strike wave, I think less 
happens are it can be done really successfully in a few key industries that can pave the way for others in those industries, but trying to replicate it in say the private industry, for example, is really hard. And we, and we just haven't been able to crack what the distinction is between those two. Yeah, I wondered if you had any theories on how to expand the number of private sector workers represented by unions. I believe the last time I checked it was somewhere right around 6%. Uh, obviously, there's uh, more of the you know national labor force. So people who work for the government are represented by unions, but in, in private industries, it's, it's a really low number. And I wondered, uh, what are your thoughts on why that is? Is it just a long history of the government, you know, beating unions, um, you know, changing legislation to make it more difficult? Um, uh, I wonder how we move forward. That's a really good question. Um, so a little bit of like history to think about why unions in the private sector are very rare anymore. Um, In the 1980s or so, when Reagan took over and sort of paved the way for how do you really bust unions now? Because they had joined, they had had so much public support by both Democrats and Republicans for so long. um, You really couldn't be considered anti-union in any real sense of the term other than maybe in certain parts in the South, which is... Which is how you get away with the air traffic controller. Yeah. Yeah. Which Jimmy Carter had a hand in, but that's, you know, neither here nor there. Um, But as that, as, as union busting started to become more popular and the idea of opening up the wealth for, you know, private industries that would then trickle down to others, the converse idea was, well, unions are really only here to represent the idea of like, you know, the, the lazy worker. And it was much easier for um, states to start enacting right to work laws that basically cut down on union dues. You didn't have to pay your union dues in order to um, receive the same benefits. Unions still had to represent you. Um, You started to see an increase in uh, retaliatory firings if people tried to organize, which technically are illegal, but Uh, businesses really found a way in the 80s and 90s to um, hone in on this and really any public relations backlash. They didn't have to face any real like fines or anything like that. Um, And this whole union busting like legal industry developed to block unions before they could ever really start and I think now in 2020, the ideas of solidarity unionism, the idea of building workplace committees that really can't be broken by the legal confines that have been set up for us to fail, um, I think are becoming much more popular with the younger generation. They want a union, they want representation, they want to organize, they hate their workplace. But obviously because of the way you know they've been screwed over since 2008's you know economic recession and now um they're afraid so i think taking this model going forward that could be one way of really building up the capacity to organize in the private sector but even again it requires money it requires funding and the afl-cio the largest labor uh, federation in the country I think in like 2018 cut their organizing budget so that they could focus on political organizing. And so like the AFL-CIO just decides they're going to <clears throat> put all their money to just electing Democrats. And they have this idea, if you elect the right, pe- the right people, everything will get better. And they sort of <clears throat> just gave up on the idea in some ways of building out membership. It's now just about like servicing contracts. If you have a contract somewhere, you have to make sure it meets these different standards rather than trying to build outward and, and build that sense of solidarity. It, it, it really doesn't exist anymore. Indeed. Well, uh, yeah, one, d- oh, you're good, Zach. Oh, go ahead, Gavin. No. Uh, I just had one more question for you. And, uh, you know, a lot of these things that we've talked about, you know, it seems like people are – 
very powerless often, especially with strikes. You know, they'll they'll be organized and then it, it won't it won't come to fruition. Um, but there are some examples of you know uh, businesses around the country that do kind of uh, try to uphold these values of direct democracy and do treat their employees uh, at least in a correct way. Um, and th- and that would be you know the model of co-ops. We see this across the country. There's a lot of you know natural grocery store co-ops that are worker owned and and the such. Uh, do you think this is a, a correct model for uh, work workplace democracy? And uh, even though people may feel powerless to uh, affecting change overall, uh, do you think it's worthy to you know vote with your dollar and support your local co-op instead of the chain? Uh, should we be encouraging people to do those uh, things? So the idea of something that is worker owned in a co-op has been used a lot of times as a cudgel to block unionization efforts. Mm. Um, I was helping with a campaign that was trying to organize a quote unquote worker owned co-op, except a third of the pe- workers there were the ones who controlled it. The other two were other two thirds were technically not worker owned, <laughs> you know, um, they were simply employees who received less pay, less benefits than the people who technically gotcha. ran it. Um, And the problem with, I think, the idea of like a co-op model is at some point, capitalism is going to make it significantly harder for them to turn a profit. And unfortunately, the way our our system is set up, if you can't turn a profit, you have to enact layoffs, pay cuts, and eventually those businesses go under. And so while I think the idea in principle of workers sort of just creating a business, owning it themselves, being able to beat the capitalists at their own game is a really good idea on paper. Unfortunately, a lot of times what I've seen is those worker-led co-ops eventually morph into the thing that they were meant to destroy. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's much easier to try to uh, break unionization efforts when you can have the veneer of saying we already have democracy here look we let you you know look at our budget we can tell you flat out we don't have the money for you know x y and z we're progressive bosses you know um and and that's where i think the flaw is yeah i know that there's some uh you know chains like i think high v grocery store uh you know pretends to be worker owned but in reality it's 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 a complete farce I do know there are some more local businesses that I, I think actually do uh, uphold those values, but I, I definitely see what you're saying, how it can be used to ultimately, you know, cudgel people and uh, remove workers' rights instead of give them. So that's, thank you for that insight. Um, yeah, Brendan, we mentioned briefly on the, um, in the podcast, Eugene Debs, who uh, is a figure in history that I'm, I'm sure many listeners are familiar with. And one of my closing questions I wanted to, uh, you know, there, he was obviously a founder of the IWW, and he has this very powerful quote, um, you know, while there's a lower class, I'm in it. While there's a criminal element, I'm of it. And while there's a soul in prison, I am not free. And I wondered um, if you could share um, anything about the work that the IWW does uh, with incarcerated workers. Obviously, I know you said that a lot of the work is, you know, still unfolding. So, there's little that could be shared, but I just thought it was really important that the IWW was, you know, working to organize workers that are, you know, currently incarcerated and exploited for their labor. Yeah. Um, So a little bit of history. The reason why the IWW organizes prisoners is obviously so many of our leaders, Eugene Debs included, um, by the way, he was actually incarcerated temporarily in the uh, prison in my hometown. Fun oh, fact. Really? Was that where he received um, the million votes for uh, office? Unfortunately, no. It was uh, right after his Canton speech, though. He was temporarily uh, incarcerated here um, in my hometown. But at the time he was incarcerated here, uh, Walter Ruther, um, as a young boy, went to visit him before he would go on to help lead the UAW in some of its most successful actions. Um, so that meeting really was, you know, foreshadowing some of what would happen in the labor movement years later. But um, to the question about, like, why this happened and, and how we organize now incarcerated workers, um, the IWW very often would have our members, like I said earlier, like, get thrown in jail, trumped up charges, they would need bail support, they would need funds. Um, This happened time and time and time again. 
um, guards would repeatedly either kill our members in jail and make it look like an accident. They would and because so many uh, incarcerated workers are also forced to work, you know, while they're in prison and paid very low wages for it. Um, the IWW always believe that if you can organize the folks inside, you can provide them support from the outside and you can achieve sort of the goals of a revolution by doing both simultaneously. It said you can't be a cop and you can't be a prison guard in our union. There's no reason why we should help organize the people who are going to arrest, beat and possibly kill our members. Um, and so today, what the I IWW's um, IWOC, the Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee does, is we try to make sure that the individuals inside prisons have the necessary things they need, like soap, um, they're not being mistreated, they have access to outside without it being taken or checked. Um, we try to provide reports from inside prisons. So if something really nefarious is going on within a prison, oftentimes it's going to be IWOC folks who are able to report it back on the outside. And the reason for that is very often the prison industrial complex has very clear um, PR campaigns to really make folks see the prisoners as ultimately dangerous. They have to be controlled. They have to be confined and in very racialized terms and ways of understanding them. And if you can counteract the messaging that they're able to put out with narratives from the folks inside, and they can see that they have the support from an actual union, not just, you know, a group of people who support them because of their family, but folks who see them as part of the working class, they're much more willing to take um, bolder actions, make tougher demands, go on, um, workplace strikes or uh, hunger strikes. Um, there was the nationwide prison strike, actually, I think in 2018, that was garnered a lot of national attention. Um, many prisoners ended up partaking. And it's a way of building this sense of like class solidarity that, you know, any one of us could end up in prison under capitalism for no fault of our own. And we need to have something that can help ensure that our rights are not taken away the minute we enter. Absolutely. Um, Brendan, I, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. We, we certainly appreciate your insight and the work that you all are doing at the IWW. Uh, is there any way that, or any place that people can go to find out more about you guys if they're interested? Absolutely. Um, we just redid our website on May Day. It's now a website in the 21st century. It looks very sleek, uh, iww.org. If you scroll down, all the information about how you can become a member, what our dues rates are, where we have chapters are all up there. We are currently expanding at the moment, and we have chapters forming, I would say, pretty much one to two new chapters every month. So if you don't have a local chapter in your area, contact the general headquarters. Their email will be on the website or you can contact uh, the organizing department board and they will be more than happy to reach out to you, connect you with folks who can help you either build a branch or form a union at your workplace. Awesome. And we can put a link to the website in uh, the description for the video. So if anybody's curious, you can find it there. Yeah. Thanks so much, Brendan. We really appreciate chatting with you and hope you have a great night. Yeah. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you both.